If the world gave us a second chance, what would we do? Should we do good? Or should we do better? What we do affects the world around us. How it all turns out depends on the choices we make. The world is now on reset. Let's strive to live smarter, to make the world better. How do I know this? Simple, smart, ako. How about you? What are you prepared to do? Sa kaginhawahan o alinlangan, may alagang maaasahan ang bawat Pilipino. Alagang tumutulong magpalakas ng resistensya. Alagang maingat magpagaling. Alagang tumutulong magbigay ng proteksyon. Noon at kailanman, patuloy ang Unilab sa pag-aalaga sa kalusugan ng bawat pamilyang Pilipino. Unilab. Alagang tunay, alagang Pilipino. Hi and welcome. I'm Jude. Hello, Jude, and I'm Father Jay, and welcome to our listeners and viewers to Sundays for Seekers. Hi, Father. Good morning, and good morning also to all those who are tuned in to our live episode of Sundays for Seekers. Yes, where we have another live episode and a very special one. Do you want to tell them why, Jude? Of course, Father. Last time we went live, it was to celebrate your birthday. No, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, this time around, um, this September, we will be celebrating another birthday this coming September 8th. And that is, of course, the birthday of Mary. And that explains our burning question for this episode. What's so special about Mary? So as we, as we discussed um, that burning question about what's so special about Mary, stay tuned because we will be having a raffle for everyone towards the end of our episode. So make sure you stay, wa- keep watching and stay tuned for the raffle later. So welcome to Sundays for Seekers. This podcast is brought to you by Smart, Live Smarter for a Better World and Unilab. Alagang tunay, alagang Pilipino, Unilab yan. Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to our live episode for Sundays for Seekers. And for this episode, we will be talking about the burning question, what's so special about Mary? So this is as we prepare for the Nativity of Mary this coming Wednesday, September 8th. But at the same time, because it's really one of the burning questions that we have as Catholics, talking about Mary, the mother of God and our mother as well. So, Father, what's so special about Mary? Well, you know, um, we Catholics, we believe in saints, right? That saints can intercede for us, can pray for us. And of course, Mary, being the mother of Jesus, is a very special place. We turn to her for her intercessions. And that's why Mary is uh, is a very special place in the hearts of Catholics, as well as other Christians. And you've been talking about, Father, in the previous episodes even, that when we pray the rosary, we get to meditate upon the mysteries and we pray to Mary to lead us more to Jesus. But one of the burning questions related to this and one of the questions we get asked a lot is, do we Catholics actually worship Mary? That's a great question. And uh, it's a very common question for people who don't quite understand the Catholic faith. Actually, you can't blame them because if you look at the churches and the schools in the Philippines and around the world, a lot of them are named after Mary, right? So you have all sorts of titles for our Blessed Mother. And then uh, parishes, schools are named after her. So it's quite understandable for people to get the impression that we actually worship Mary. But that's a misconception because Mary isn't God, so we don't worship her. What we do is we venerate her, we honor her because she's the mother of Jesus. 
just like you know like uh if you admire someone if you respect someone obviously you will also the mother uh, you will also you know like honor the mother of that person that's a good way to put it father uh we venerate and honor that person but we don't worship mary per se so thank you for that i hope that not only enlightened me but also our viewers and listeners this morning if you do have any burning questions about mary please feel free to join our discussion and comment your questions or any insights that you may have pertaining to what's so special about mary but moving further father you mentioned about mary's titles and you know growing up i've been hearing many different ways that Mary has been called. I grew up in a Marian parish, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. There's this parish across Savior, Mary the Queen. And so there are really many different titles. So why does Mary have all of these titles? Parang, ano ba yan, Father? Split persona ba yan? Marami siyang you know, facets and faces. Di naman, but I think it's, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with... Uh, the apparitions that we believe she actually did, right? So the Catholics believe in certain Marian apparitions that our Blessed Mother, because of her special intercessory power, she appeared several times in history to intercede, no? to ask for prayers. So for example, Fatima, Lourdes, and that explains partly why she has so many titles because of all these places. And also the titles are really sort of descriptions of her. So there's no one that's better than the other. There are just different ways of getting to know our Blessed Mother. No? But if there's one title I think that's most special, it would be Mary, the Mother of God. But it's also the most controversial no? because a uh, non-Catholic would, would, would agree with us that Mary is the Mother of Jesus, but they're not so comfortable calling her the Mother of God for yeah. obvious reasons, right? So, you know, it's, it's important, I think, to clarify why do Catholics call her the mother of God? No? And, and uh, a short way of explaining that is that we believe that Jesus was only one person and our Lord was both human and divine. So if Mary is the mother of Jesus, the human being, she's also in a very special mother. way the mother of God. That's, that's the real reason. It's not because we want to heap praises on Mary. It's because Jesus is one. Otherwise, Jesus would have a split personality, one human and one divine, right? So there was a whole argument about that. Eh? And the church decided to define it, that, you know, that um, Mary is the mother of God because Jesus is only one. That's true. Thank you for that, Father. But just a, well, just a curious question. How did the church, uh, if you can enlighten us about this process or decision that the church came up with, um, how did they come up with that um, conclusion that Mary is the mother of God, that she is she was born without original sin? So, in, in of course, in simple simpler terms, I'm sure it will take you much more time if you have to go through each one. But maybe just to in a way explain a little bit as to how all of these came to be and where these came from as well. Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of what we believe in the Catholic Church, including the things we believe about Mary, are not spoken in the Bible. No? So remember what we said, no, that in the Bible, there are a lot of things that are spoken, that are written, but there are also many things that are not written. And you have to read between the lines. No? So if you're a fundamentalist, you would focus only on what is actually said in the Bible. And obviously in the Bible, it does not say that Mary is the mother of God. No? It does not say that um, Mary was born without original sin or that he, she was immaculately conceived. In fact, there's nothing about original sin in the Bible. No? Uh, so if you're going to stick to the Bible, many things are not there. But the, the church in the, from the earliest times has always reflected on the Bible and uh, prayed over it and has read between the lines and came to certain conclusions. And one of them was this whole debate you know, about whether Jesus is, uh, you know, both divine and human as one person. And one, one conclusion that they reach from that is, yes, Jesus is one. But the other conclusion is, therefore, Mary isn't just the mother of Jesus. She's also the mother of God. So it's because of all these things that are not in the Bible. But people, you know, people wondered about their, their faith. They asked questions about Jesus, about Mary. And these were the answers that 
the church with the help of the Holy Spirit, we believe, uh, were able to was able to formulate. No? Uh, the other thing there is the, uh, the thing about original sin. No? Um, the church thought that if Mary was going to be the mother of Jesus and the mother of God, it's not impossible for God to actually grant her an exception from original sin. And that's what the Immaculate Conception means. No? So the, the church defined that. So that's that's really what's special about Mary also that aside from Jesus she's o she's the only other human being who does not have original sin. It really shows father how important it is to ask questions, right? Because as you were saying one of the reasons why they came up with all of this is because they started asking questions, wondering about it and then figuring out with the help of the Holy Spirit what all of these mean and what they could actually also mean in light of what is happening and in light of our world right now as well. Yeah, so our faith really gets richer when we ask questions, you know, because for example, the early Christian community, they were very curious about Jesus. They were curious about his mother. So they asked all these questions. So they prayed together. They asked for the Holy Spirit to guide them and they reached these conclusions. So today, the faith that we have in the Catholic church is so much rich, richer and deeper because of the centuries of prayer and reflections and question asking that has happened. That's why our podcast is really encouraging people to ask questions, right? Because we want our faith to be richer. Yeah, and it's when, as you mentioned, it's when we ask these questions that we understand more and our faith deepens as well. And speaking of questions, Father, we have a couple of questions already from our viewers and listeners right now. Um, one question from Dolores Lee. I've been asked, why do we need to pray to or through the saints when we can pray directly to God? Didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, again, that's a great, you know, our, our listeners and viewers ask such great questions. It almost reminds me of my theology comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's a great question. In fact, we don't need to pray to the saints. No, she, uh, Dolores is absolutely right and her friends are absolutely right. We pray directly to God. No? We pray directly to Jesus. No, We don't need the saints. No, But the saints can help. If you remember that story about the healing of the paralytic in the gospel, remember what happened there. Uh, there was this paralytic and our Lord was preaching and was surrounded by a big crowd and the paralytic obviously could not get to, to our Lord, right? So what did the friends do? They brought the paralytic on a stretcher and they actually climbed the, the house and created a hole on the roof and brought down the, the paralytic, right? And the paralytic was healed. Our Lord said, uh, the faith, your, your faith has healed you, but it's also the faith of the friends, right? So we can think of the saints as the friends of the paralytic, no? Uh, we could use some help, no? And, and saints are very close to God and, they, and we believe that they continue to care for us. It won't hurt for them to help us, right? To pray with us and to pray for us. I certainly rely a lot of uh, a lot on the saints. So whenever I need help, of course, I pray to God directly. I pray to the Lord Jesus directly. Um, I don't have to go through the saints, but it's helpful if I go to the saints as well, right? If, if a lot of us are praying for the same thing, maybe our Lord will listen more, you know, will pay attention more. So that's, that's the logic behind praying to a saint like Mary. And of course, Mary, is one of the most powerful saints you know, as far as we we are concerned, right? So I, I personally have had a strong devotion to Mary all my life because when I was growing up, I had an older sister who was very devoted to her. She had an altar full of saints. You know? It was a fundamentalist born-again Christian's nightmare, I think, to see the altar because <laughs> there were so many saints, uh, so many statues there. And many of them are, are Blessed Mother statues, you know, like Fatima, Lourdes, and so on and so forth. So I, I kind of imbibe that devotion to Mary. And many times in my life, I found a lot of consolation and help uh, from, from our Blessed Mother. You know? uh, I, I visited Lourdes, for example, and Fatima, and I really felt her presence you know, and her, her help as far as my spiritual life is concerned. That's so true, Father. Uh, I think it reminds me of, well, because in school, we always say the names of the saints at the end of our prayers, right? And it's, a, it's such a simple thing, but it's a good reminder that when we call for the saints, we call for them to pray for us. 
and not for them to heal us, not for them to um, listen to us, but rather to pray for us. Unlike when we pray to the Lord, we ask for different things. We ask Him to hear us, to heal us, to be with us. But it, when it comes to the saints, it's really to pray for us and with us, as you mentioned a while ago. Yeah, when we have a litany, for example, whenever we call on our Lord Jesus, like Second Heart of Jesus, we always say, have mercy on us, mm -hmm. right? But when it comes to the saints, like Mary, we always say, pray for us. So there's a real difference there. Yeah. That's true. Thank you, Father. Um, another question from Michelle Juan. What do you think about the Marian apparitions? Real vision or mass delusion? And I wonder why so much focus on apparitions by Mary through the years? Yeah, that's another difficult question, no? because uh, I think the answer is both. No? Uh, some claims to Marian apparitions are, are false, right? Uh, I remember there was a time, uh, I, th I think it was back in the 70s, uh, what was fashionable then was Marian apparitions everywhere in the Philippines. No? Like you would see Mary on a banana leaf, you would see Mary here and there. So that's why the church is very strict about uh, acknowledging or recognizing or accepting uh, apparitions. So in fact, many of the apparitions we consider genuine today, recognized by the church like Fatima and Lourdes, the visionaries, the so-called visionaries, went through a lot of interrogation. No? And many of them suffered as a result of the suspicion of even the bishops. Because obviously, if today, if a friend of yours say, you know, came to you and said, hey, Jude, you know, yesterday I saw a vision of Mary. What's the first thing that's going to come to your mind, right? You're probably going to wonder, this guy probably forgot his medications yesterday or maybe got drunk or something or whatever, right? So, so there, there is a suspicion, and rightly so. We should not easily be gullible, right? But uh, the church has judged that there are particular times in history when our Blessed Mother actually appeared no? and had messages. So the church made a judgment that these particular apparitions are authentic. Uh, it, it really, what it tells us is that Mary continues to be active and continues to intercede for us in a special way. No? In the same way when we pray to saints, no? they, I, mean, I mean, the saints don't have too many apparitions, but sometimes they have miracles, right? But Mary has a special place because she's the mother of God. And apparently, according to the church, there have been authentic moments when she actually appeared to try to help humanity. You know? An example of that would be Lourdes, Fatima, these are the more uh, popular ones. No? Father, speaking of that, um, is it wrong to pray to Mary or to a Marian apparition that hasn't been approved yet or to support an apparition? Um, I think it, well, you know, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer because only God should answer that question, right? For example, many people go to Medjugorje and the people I've talked to, including priests who've been there, they, they really swear that there's a very special experience there, a very special religious experience. They really feel the presence of Mary, the devotion of the people. So they, they, and many of them have returned changed for the better stronger in their faith and more intense in their devotion. But Medjugorje is one of the apparitions that hasn't been recognized by the church. No? So is it wrong for people to go there? Um, I think it, it would be very hard to say it's wrong. At the very end of the day, only God can say that. And I think what's important is the, the effect, the effect of the apparition on you, right? So if you go to Medjugorje, for example, or uh, any other place where there's a claim of an apparition, I think you should look at the fruits of your visit. Did it make you closer to God? Did it make you more generous with other people? No? Did it make you more humble? I think these are the signs to look out for. Are you more intense in your prayer life? And I think if they're okay, that means that whether the apparition was authentic or not, God did his work. And what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that, right? Thank you for that, Father. Because as you mentioned, there are many different apparitions and um, sometimes, well, we don't, I personally don't know which apparitions are, or which ones are, or like, so it helps that instead of trying to figure out if they're authentic or not right away, it's what's more important, as you mentioned, is really the effect on us 
and how it leads us closer to Jesus as well. And you uh, also look at the you also look at the message, like right? And we have to you have to exercise course. your judgment there. Sometimes some messages of some claims of an operation are a little bit ridiculous. So you you have, I mean that that should be a red flag, right? But if it's something like you know pray pray more, uh, repent, these are very acceptable messages, no? So we have to look at the messages and what they're trying to tell us, and also the effect on us if we actually visit. So, Father, we've been talking about apparitions, so that would explain the titles of Mary, like Our Lady of Lourdes, Fatima, um, and uh, titles of Mary that are based on places usually. But what about the titles of Mary that are placed on, uh, that are based on um, actual titles, like Mary the Queen, um, Immaculate Conception, or Mary... There's one Mary, mother of the youth. Where did all of these come from? Well, it, it's, it's a question of, uh, some of them are special devotions. Like, for example, Mary, mother of the youth. It's because, you know, in a way, we believe that she's also a special patroness over the youth. Uh, her being queen, basically, is an allusion to her being queen of heaven because uh, uh, we believe that she has been crowned queen of heaven after her assumption, right? The Immaculate Conception is a very special title because it's a dogma that the church defined to say that she was exempted from um, original sin. In fact, what's interesting is when Our Lady appeared to Bernadette in Lourdes, this uh, shepherdess, no? and, um, and, and when, when, when Bernadette asked her, because the bishops kept and the people kept telling her, ask her who she is, you know, when she asked uh, this lady who was appearing to her who she was, the answer of the lady was, I am the Immaculate Conception. That was one of the proofs that it was authentic because they were saying there was no way this uneducated girl would have understood what the Immaculate Conception is, you know. So, so there are many stories behind the titles, and it's actually worth, you know, like make, uh, googling about them to find out about more. But they basically, re, uh, you know, reveal to us the different facets of Our Lady. Father, just a quick uh, rewind or quick context check. What is a dogma? Okay, that's a that's a good question. A dogma is a is a mo a special moment in the church when the church clarifies something, no, as uh, as something that every Catholic must believe in, must accept to be Catholic, no. Um, so so it's very rare that the church does that. One of those moments was when it defined the Immaculate Conception. In back in the nineteenth century, the Immaculate Conception actually has been a belief in the church. All these times from the very beginning, no, but it was only the 19th century that it was defined formally as a dogma. Thank you, Father. So at least we're all on the same page regarding these things. There's a there's an insight, a comment here. I never really thought about them much in terms of the apparitions, as I kind of gloss over them. But given the the question, how Father Johnny answered it, made me appreciate them insofar as the effect of the apparition to a person is. So, uh, you know, the apparition you. is not something we're required to believe in. You know, it, it's, it's, an, it's an extra devotion. You know, a devotion to Mary isn't something required. You, don't, you, you won't go to hell if you don't have a devotion to Mary. I have many friends who are very good Catholics and very good Christians. They don't feel a special devotion to Mary, but it's fine. You know, the devotion to Mary is just another means for you to get closer to God. So if you don't need that, that's great. But if, if you're like me, I've found it helpful to make me closer to God, then, then you know, by all means, we can resort to our Blessed Mother. So it, that, that rings true for the saints as well, Father? That's true. Yes, yes. Also for the saints. So, you know, like St. Ignatius said, right? Finding God in all things. So we should rely on anything that will bring us closer to God. And we believe in what we call the communion of saints, where... Even the, the, the people we love, when they die, they can pray for us. No? Uh, assuming that they're in heaven, they're, as, uh, you know, they're united with God, they can pray for us, they can intercede for us. So I always say during wake masses, we don't just pray for the dead, we also pray to them because they can watch over us more than ever. Next question, Father. So we talked about the apparitions, the Immaculate Conception, and now another um, another event in the life of Mary, the Assumption. So from 
Lorraine Sanchez, since Assumption of Mary is based on oral tradition and is not found directly in the scriptures, what is the best way to explain this to others? Did the apostles see her go up to heaven, body and soul? No, no, the, there's no such thing. No, uh, There's no such record. There's no such claim that they actually witnessed her going up to heaven the way they witnessed Jesus ascending to heaven. No? Uh, some people say that's why it's called the assumption. You assume that you went to heaven <laughs> because nobody saw it. No, But the assumption is another dogma that the church defined. But again, it's a result of reflecting on the Immaculate Conception, right? Because we believe that because of original sin, our bodies get corrupt and we, we die and our bodies turn to ashes and dust, right? But if Mary was exempted from original sin, just like our Lord, if she's immaculately conceived, then we can also assume that she was taken to heaven, body and soul. Because everyone else, excluding Jesus and Mary, our bodies remained here and our bodies and soul will be reunited only in the last judgment, right? But there's an exception also on the part of Mary because it makes sense. If you don't have original sin, your body will not be subjected to that. Connected question, Father, from Cecil La. I'm guessing this is Cecilia. Um, she asked in the Facebook group, actually, pardon the question, but the story of Mary, Mary is actually incredible, bordering on the unbelievable. If a girl now says she is pregnant but has not had any relations with a man, nor has had any medical intervention, I would say she is lying. I would too. <laughs> Other than faith, now here's the question. How do we tell non-believers that what happened to Mary and the whole story of the nativity and the life of Jesus are true? Wow. That's a very good question and a very difficult question to answer, no? because uh, you're right. No? If, if anybody came up to me today and made all the same claims that Mary did, I'm going to you know, probably call for medical help, right? And, and, and worry about this person and maybe suspect she's lying or she's having hallucinations, no? Because uh, the claims, what, what the story of Mary is really incredible, bordering on the unbelievable, just like all the other stories in the Bible. All the other stories in the Bible are actually incredible, bordering on the unbelievable, no? And, and so this brings me to your question, uh, Cecilia. Now, your question is, how do we tell non-believers that what happened to Mary in the whole story of the nativity and life of Jesus is true? The, the answer to that is we don't. We can't. Because we can't prove it. Because as you say, and, and actually it applies to everything in the Bible, everything's unbelievable. No? And, and faith is a matter of choice. Um, remember what we said early on, no? faith is not 100% certainty. No? There's no way we can be sure that Mary was telling the truth. But you can make a choice and be committed to what she said. No, It's really a choice that you make, even if you're not sure. And especially because you're not sure. So it brings us back to our, to our definition of faith. Faith is not 100% certainty, but hopefully 100% commitment despite the uncertainty. That's what we mean by trust, right? We're not sure, but we will trust. We will choose to trust. So... But I think I like this question because it also reveals to us that Mary went through a lot of difficulties. Sometimes we gloss over that because we say, oh, she's the mother of God. She's the queen of heaven. But she actually suffered a lot. No? And when you think about it, for us to have a full appreciation of Mary, you can't just uh, sort of focus on her being the mother of God. That's important. No? But just as importantly, and sometimes even more importantly, she was also a disciple of our Lord. She, she couldn't figure out who her son was. Remember the finding at the temple when she said, son, why did you do this to us? You disappeared, you know? And the son and, and the child just said, well, I had to do my father's business. She didn't understand that, you know? but she just pondered it in her heart. You know? So all her life, she kept trying to keep up with her son. Just like us, when we're trying to follow our Lord, we're trying to keep up with the Lord. We, we, you know, it's hard, right? So um, more important than her being mother of God, I think she was a great disciple of our Lord. And she, we can draw a lot of inspiration and instruction from her life. No? How did she try to figure out her son? How did she try to follow her son? How did she try to be a faithful disciple? I think Mary is a great example of that. So we shouldn't just parang obsess over her being mother of God, period. She's both the mother of God 
and also a great disciple of our Lord. We have to balance the two. It's important to balance the two. Otherwise, we will have a sort of distorted appreciation of our Blessed Mother. I would say that many of our Christian brethren who are not Catholics probably focus more on Mary as being the disciple of Jesus and the mother of Jesus. We Catholics tend to focus more on Mary being the mother of God. But that's not giving enough credit to her because she, she went through a lot, as Cecilia pointed out, and, uh, and you know, she, she was really, she tried her best to be a disciple. That's a good point, Father. That's a very good point that you shared with us. So she's not only the mother of God, but she's also a great disciple of Jesus. And speaking of that, um, well, that point on Mary being the mother of God, there's another question from Martin Gomez, burning but maybe controversial. If Mary is Theotokos, doesn't that mean God the Son is also God the Father in relation to Mary? Then there's God the Spirit. So, paano na? Okay, wait. I have, to, I have to pause for a while and try to wrap my mind around that question. So, Theotokos literally means Mother of God. And that's, the I think, the most special title of our Blessed Mother. No? Okay, let's, let's uh, unpack this question from Martin Gomez. Can you read it again? <laughs> if Mary is Theotokos, so Mother of God, doesn't that mean God the Son is also God the Father in relation to Mary? Then there's God the Spirit. So, paano na? Yun ang tanong, no? Paano na, di ba? Because we, it's, it's, you know, what, what we've done here is we're, so, we're trying to make sense of two great mysteries. No? One is uh, the divine motherhood of Mary. So, Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is God, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're also bringing in the, the Blessed Trinity, you know, where we have one God but three persons, no? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Mary is the mother of the Son, you know, who is God. So Mary is the mother of God. So we can't really figure it out there. Eh, no? So obviously Mary is not the mother of the Father, right? Mary is not the mother of the Spirit. No? But we, that's, that's one of the things we can't really figure, you know, like, like sort of lay out in an equation. Eh. So again, it's good to ask those questions, but... I, I don't think I can answer that question also. It's one of those things where you just sort of allow yourself to be awed by the great mystery of God and, and the, of salvation history, no? Some comments, Father, from Anne Divina Gracia. The sight of Our Lady of Lourdes has a strong effect on us, especially the procession at night. I think you mentioned that one time, Father, right? Yes, yes. I, I mentioned, because I've been to Lourdes and also to Fatima. Fatima. The processions are great. There are two very different processions. No? In Lourdes, you have all these sick people who are processing, no? and they're being blessed. Uh, There's a special blessing. They're very moving. No? The same in Fatima. So it's really, it's a very powerful experience. There used to be a Lourdes grotto here near Novaliches before. I don't know what's happened to it, but I remember visiting it about maybe three times in my life when I was younger. No? And there's a life-size station of the cross, which you kind of do. But in the grotto, you have all these crutches that are hanging because these are people who feel they've been healed by their visit. No? So it's a very moving experience. So sometimes making a pilgrimage to, to these sites can really be very helpful. Another one from Anna Lim Tupas. When my late mom and late ate were critically ill, I always prayed and called on Mama Mary for help. Praying the memorare is what I prayed. What I relied on was the part of the prayer that said, never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection was left unaided. Uh, who is this again, Jude? Anna Tupas. Well, Anna, I just want to say that the mem memorare is one of my favorite prayers. When I get really desperate, that's the prayer I say. I learned that when I was in high school. No, And uh, for me, it's always what I turn to when I can't pray because I'm too scared or too sad. But that, the, the words of that prayer are so reassuring, as you say. So I love it that you mentioned that prayer. It's one of my all-time favorite prayers. Mine too, because of the YCLC, Father. Uh, from Jen. Hi, Miss Jen. Uh, I appreciate Mary suffering the most when I pray the sorrowful mysteries. As a mother, worrying about the safety and wellness of our children, I cannot imagine how she felt all throughout the Passion. And that's a great example of, you know, like contemplating that we were talking about last, uh, the last episode where you imagine yourself, you imagine the scene and you imagine, if possible, you're part of the scene. No? And, and this is an example of you allowing your context to enrich your 
prayer, no? Because as a mother, um, Jen is able to imagine or or fail to imagine what Mary must have been going through. So the stories, the sorrowful mysteries, the events that are recounted there become even more real and powerful because of the context of Jen, right? So we should do that all the time so we can really appreciate what Mary and our Lord went through. Many times we just skim through the stories. We don't give them justice, no? But if we read between the lines, there's so much going on there that's not said. And when we connect to context, when our prayer connects to our context, it really feeds into our faith and deepens our faith even more. Uh, one last comment from Gina Lomotan. Thank you, Father J&J, for an insightful and graceful discussion on Mary. I appreciated your bringing the discussion to more realistic terms. I have always appreciated the important example role of Mary in Jesus' life and as an intercessor, which was proven in the healing of a family member during this pandemic. Grateful thanks for tackling this relevant topic of Mary's special role during this pandemic to inspire others to keep trusting God and to keep the faith. And thank you, Gina, for sharing the news that one family member of yours uh, recovered as a result of the intercession of our Blessed Mother. Very last, Father, sorry. Very last from Isusa. Um, It is easier for me to share with another human being than the Lord at times. To me, Mother Mary is that human for all times. When you need to decide between yes or no, you can count on her to counsel you. That's so true. I have the same wow. experience. And uh, yeah, that's really her role in our lives. So there are times when we feel it's easier to go to her. So we should feel free to do that. No, uh, Of course, we, can o- we should always go to the Lord. But there are times, of course, that we prefer to go to a mother. So, and and that's, that's why Mary is there. Yeah, that's true. I, I also have the same feeling of really having a mother to, to be there with you and for you instead of being quite intimidated with Jesus um, and the Lord right away. So you have a caring mother who will be taking you nearer to her son as well. You know, Father, there are many different, many more questions that we can discuss about this topic on Mary. And this might not be our first and last episode about her, but it was a good start, I would say talking about what makes Mary so special because she's such a special uh, human and divine person that I would like to bring to light what Martin actually said. He said, we'll continue to pray along these mysteries. So there are questions that we can answer and there are questions we can't answer. But what's important is that, as you mentioned a while ago, Father, we pray along these mysteries and we pray that all of these lead us closer to Jesus and to God as well. But Joe, just to be precise, uh, Mary is not a divine person. No? She, it's, it's important to be very precise there. In fact, the, the, the Greek Orthodox Church, they have a tradition where Jesus is always portrayed as wearing something red and having a, a blue garment over him, which means that he took on humanity. For our Blessed Mother, she's always wearing something blue and then her veil and, and she has a shawl that's colored red because God has given her a special gift to be the mother of God. So she's not divine. Thank you for that, Father. May pahabol pa. So she's not divine, but she's special. Yun nga talaga. She's special and was chosen to be the mother of God. So um, as mentioned, we will have more questions about this, but please stick around for our raffle. We'll just have a quick announcement and quick break. And then we'll head on to our raffle later on. Every Sunday, Pins of Light comes up with a one-minute homily. Something to provoke you into prayer and reflection. Get your weekly Sunday Gospel Fix. Follow the Pins of Light Facebook page at facebook.com slash pinsoflight. Also available in Filipino at facebook.com slash pinoylights. If you want to subscribe to Sundays for Seekers, you can find us in all the usual places where you find podcasts. Be a Sunday Seeker by joining our Facebook group, Sundays for Seekers, at facebook.com slash groups 
slash Sundays4S. Tell your friends about us by using the hashtag, hashtag Sundays4S. So we're now um, in our raffle part. Actually, it's not so much a raffle. It's some sort of a quiz by Father Jay. But before we head in on to that, um, and before we announce how you can win our prize for today, so we have three books up for grabs, three pins of light books, so by Father Jay. We have one gift first, so one book that we will be giving to Cecilia because she was the only one actually who asked in our Facebook group regarding what's so special about Mary. So as a form of gratitude and thanks for being courageous and brave to ask your question, we will be gifting you with a Pins of Light book. So we'll get in touch with you regarding that gift later on, Cecilia. So Father, would you like to share with us the quiz or game? And how do you want to say it? Quiz okay, so yeah, it's really a quiz. Uh... Uh, you know, recently for my birthday, uh, a friend of mine organized a Zoom where we had virtual games, online games. So it's really exciting. So we won't do anything as techy as that, but very simple. I will ask three questions and the person who posts the correct answer first will win. Okay. It's important that your answer shows up on our screen. No. Uh, and we will let you know who the winner is and we will get in touch with you and send you the book Pints of Light, Scattered Hints About God. That's my newest book, um, a collection of homilies and reflections that's coming out this month. No? So the first question, are you ready? So remember, if you answer, you have to put Q1 because it's the first question. No? So um, you have to put Q1, T, or F because it's a true or false question. Okay, true or false. A devotion to Mary is a requirement for you to be Catholic. True or false. Okay. True or false, a devotion to Mary is a requirement for you to be Catholic. So again, okay. please make sure you place Q1. Oh, there, Father, Ayana. Do we have a first, uh, do we have a winner? Yes. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we'll be basing it on the comment, the first comment that we will be, that, that I will be seeing from the Pins of Light page. So the first one to comment, Q1, uh, Father, say, uh, answers Muna. So, but, Majority are saying F. Actually, lahat F. That's the correct answer. It's not a That's requirement. The correct answer. So it's false. The devotion to Mary is not a requirement for you to be Catholic. And the first person who answered is Mates Bautista Concepcion. Okay, congratulations. You will get a free copy of Pains of Light with a dedication. So we will send it to you. Okay. The wow. second question. Okay, it's another true or false uh, question. This time you have to type Q2. T or F, true or false, okay? Okay, here's the question. True or false, the Immaculate Conception is the only Catholic dogma about Mary. True or false? Again, the Immaculate Conception is the only Catholic dogma about Mary. True or false? Don't forget Q2. And then your answer, true or false? There are a couple of answers already, Father. Okay, the, correct, I... the correct answer is false because the assumption is also another Catholic dogma, as we said. So correct answer is false. So the answers are actually half and half right now. Half false, half true. Okay. But the first person who answered false is Mitch Rentino. Okay, congratulations, Mitch. We will also send you a copy of Pins of Light. Our final question. Okay, this one is a multiple choice question. So write down the letter that corresponds to what you think is the right choice. Okay, so it's A, B, C, or D. Okay, which of the following Marian apparitions has not been officially recognized by the church? A, Lourdes. B, Fatima. C, Medjugorje. D, Guadalupe. Again, which of the following Marian apparitions has not been officially recognized by the church? A, Lourdes, B, Fatima, C, Medjugorje, and D, Guadalupe. Ambilis sumagot, Father. Okay. 
The answer, of course, is C, Medjugorje, because Lourdes, Fatima, and Guadalupe have been recognized as authentic Marian apparitions by the church. So who's our winner? Our winner for the third and last book for this episode is Michelle Vincoy. So congratulations, Michelle. Congratulations, Michelle. So we, what we'll do is we'll send the books to them uh, once we get their details. So okay. some of them may still want to order the book. Uh, we're still accepting pre-orders. So the details are there on the screen. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your participation. But I think you'll need to, uh, we'll need to have more book giveaways in the next episodes. Ang dami talaga. Ang daming, ang daming, ano, um, sumasagot. And, but aside from that, what's more important is that we learn from the questions that Father asked us as well. So just to recap, the first question, um, a devotion to Mary is not a requirement for you to be Catholic. The second, the Immaculate Conception is not the only Catholic dogma about Mary. There's also the Assumption. And the last is, um, the which of the following Marian apparitions has not been officially recognized by the Church? That is C, Medjugorje. But remember what we said, it almost doesn't matter if it's been recognized by the church or not. What's important is your interpretation of the messages, the alleged messages, and also your the effect on you as a Catholic. There. So thank you again. Um, can you post how to order? The screen is small. We'll, we'll send it in the comments. And it's also on the Pins of Light page. So there's a full poster there. There. So you've been, uh, we've replied to your question and you can access the full poster via that Facebook link. So Father Jay, what's your takeaway question for this episode? Okay. Earlier we said that for a full appreciation of Mary, it's important to recognize her not only as mother of God, but also a disciple of Jesus. So I'd like our listeners and viewers to just examine themselves and ask themselves, what is their tendency? Do they tend to think of Mary more as mother of God or more as disciple of Jesus? I think the answer is important because it will help you balance more your appreciation of Mary. So for example, if for you, Mary is usually the mother of God, maybe you can begin to discover her more as a disciple of our Lord. And if for you, she's more of a disciple of the Lord, maybe appreciate her more in her powerful intercession as the mother of God. I think a more balanced, a fuller interpretation of Mary is going to happen if we have both. Mother of God, disciple of Jesus. So thank you. Thank you for that, Father. It's a good reflection question to have and to strengthen our devotion to Mary, our mother and mother of God. So once again, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Smart and Unilab, for sponsoring our podcast and helping make this podcast possible. And of course, to our listeners and viewers, thanks again for supporting us and joining us in this live uh, podcast. We plan to continue to have live, live episodes for the rest of the season because that's the request. And it's been more fun, really, because of the interaction. So that's it for our 10th episode. We hope you will continue to join us in our next live episodes. And, of course, tell your friends about us so that they, too, can join us in our live discussions and be a seeker just like you and us. So Jude, thanks again, as always, for a great conversation. And I'd like to thank our viewers and listeners who participated. The conversation is so much more fun when, when they're posting their comments, right? So very special thanks to all those who have tuned in and participated. Yes, and even made more fun, Father, by your giveaway book. <laughs> so hopefully next time around, you'd have more giveaways for our viewers and listeners. So we hope to see you at our next podcast. Again, share our Facebook page, our Facebook group rather, and you can hear us and listen to the podcast on the many different platforms you can find podcasts. Yes, and please tell your friends about us. And meanwhile, as we always say here, whenever we wrap up, keep the faith. And keep on seeking. The Sundays for Seekers logo was designed by Jem Jemson Tan. Our theme was composed by Marvin Ong. And this episode was produced with Glenn Lopez of Upstream Media PH.
Sundays for Seekers has been brought to you by Smart Live Smarter for a Better World and Unilab Alagang Tunay Alagang Pilipino Unilab yan!